That phrase, under promise and over deliver, it's become a bit of a marketing cliche. Like, how many businesses actually do it? Does yours? In my experience, not many do, which makes it a pretty solid marketing strategy. So listen in, because you're about to discover how to create magic moments in your business. Welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show, where successful small business owners share their secrets to take your marketing to the next level. Now, here's your host, Tim Reid. Welcome back, listeners, to another episode of Australia's number one marketing show. I am your host, Timbo Reid, but you, so much more importantly, are a motivated small business owner ready to crank out some great marketing. And without further ado, we are going to get stuck right in because we have got lots of marketing ground, lots of marketing gold, actually, to share with you to help you build your business. And remember, this show is made possible by the very good folks at Net Registry and 99 Designs. More on them later. But listen to this. This is what we are going to cover in the next hour or so. How to create magic moments in your business with my guest, Ray Sakluna, who started the Video Easy franchise all those years ago. No longer in it, hey? Not a business you'd want to be in now, but boy, did he do it well. I've got a listener question asking me how to target specific groups of people, so I'll answer that one. I've got some wonderful listener feedback for around episode 208, which was the episode about how to use humor to help grow your business. Got a really interesting forum update, a couple of very, very interesting developments inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. And of course, we will finish with the inspirational quote of the week. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Righto, let's get stuck in to a listener question. Now, these listener questions are made possible thanks to the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. And as I said, a couple of interesting updates. But first, this is a question from Terence Jansen. Terence says, hey, Timbo, love your podcast. It gives me lots of energy to work on my business. Nice, Terence. We like working on the business, not always in the business. Terence says, my target clients, call them your best mates, Terence, are brides, grooms, and corporate clients. I deliver yoga and fitness classes, but I am struggling to identify how best to market to these groups. For corporate clients, cold calling and following up with a prospectus appears to have a low rate of success, and establishing a corporate class tends to require an advocate within an organization. Yeah, well, that's true. I'll show you how to get one of those or at least get to them. For wedding groups, I am thinking wedding expos and some content marketing. Yeah, expos can be expensive, but could be could be effective. Um, thinking about content marketing, about remaining stress-free on the lead up to the wedding day. Interesting. He goes on to say, do you have some tips? <laughs> do you have some tips or should I sign up to your forum? <laughs> Obvious question he puts in brackets. Well, of course, I think you should sign up to the Small Business Big Marketing Forum, Terence. That's a no-brainer. Uh, but uh, I'll give you some I'll give you some quick start ideas now. He goes on to say, anyhow, congratulations on 200 episodes. You've helped me through my first 18 months of business. My pleasure. I, I mostly escaped from Planet Cubicle. Ah, still in the cubicle, Terence. Good on you, mate. Well, um, good luck with escaping at full time. Here's a couple of tips on how you can help. I can help you do that targeting those two client groups. Uh, Number one, corporate-wise, getting to those corporates, have a listen to the episode in where I interviewed the owner of Fruitbox, Martin Helfen. It's episode 198, and I'll put it in the show notes for this episode, which is episode 210. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. He delivers fruit boxes into corporate Australia, And he very clearly explains how he gets to the advocate. The advocate for him is the HR person, the human resources person in that business. And he's got some really clever ideas and tips and tricks to do that. Um, He positioned his service, the fruit box, as a reward to staff, a way um, and it really improved staff retention. And I think you can do the same. It's about how you view your, your offer, Terence. And yours again, for corporates, yoga classes, that's a reward. 
and HR are always looking for nice, simple, cost-effective ways to reward staff to increase staff retention. So the big one there is to listen to episode 198 of this show. Uh, For weddings, for brides and grooms, Terence, I love the idea of joint ventures. Go and find people who have already got the attention of your audience. I'm thinking venues, like reception venues. I'm thinking florists. I'm thinking MCs and DJs, tailors, um, dressmakers, and do joint ventures with them. Invite them to a yoga class to experience your services. Um, Have a nice little brochure ready for them. And to that point of content marketing that you mentioned, have some content ready for them as well that you can say, hey, here's some videos, some tips that I can already give you that you can pass on to your bride-to-be, to the grooms that you're working with and get a sense of what you do so they can develop trust because as, as joint venture partners, they're going to want to trust you. And yes, you may have to... Um, offer them some commission, or you could do a quid pro quo where they send business your way and you send business their way. So Terence, mate, thank you for the question. I hope there's some ideas there for you. Listeners, get inside the forum because these are the decide, these are the, the types of discussions that we have inside the forum. I said there were a couple of um, uh, developments over at the forum Two really good ones. In fact, um, there is a webinar that I recorded this week up there in which I help one of the forum members break through a blockage as to what they're going to do next with their business. So we had a live webinar. Lots of forum members came on and we helped this particular forum member, Nick, work through a particular business blockage that he's got. And that is the power of the forum. It's almost like a mastermind, isn't it? Where We just get there and help each other move our businesses along. That was great. There's also a new section called Weekly Wins where we're sharing our wins. And it's just great. They could be big or small wins. And it's just a wonderful way to put it out there and share your successes. And that has um, a subconscious kind of uh, effect where it just make you, it makes you feel good. It's great to see the successes of others and it pushes us all forward. So get over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com, hit the forum button, join. It's a dollar for the first seven days. So really, what's stopping you? Okay, so this show is made possible by two very special companies. Two companies that can help you Grow your marketing. I know this show helps you grow your marketing, grow your business, but these guys then, it's when it's time for the rubber to hit the design road or the online marketing road, these are the guys to help you. Number one, 99 designs, okay? You can get a design that you love at a price you can afford, starting at $299. They've got a community of over 800,000 designers. You can get anything designed there. Logos, business cards, brochures, book covers, car wraps, signage. It just goes on and on and on. And it's a design competition. Here's how it works. Simple steps. Post a brief for what you want designed. Watch as dozens of designers submit their finished concept. Yeah, Finished concept, not proposal, finished concept. You then give feedback to shape their ideas to your needs, and then you award the prize money to the designer who you like the best, and they release the high-res files to you. And all that happens within seven days. It's amazing. Prices start from $299. That includes the prize money and the posting of your brief. And as a listener to this show, you get a free power pack upgrade worth $99, which will give you on average 185% more designs. You got to love that. Head over to 99designs, that's the number 99, designs.com forward slash SBBM. That stands for Small Business Big Marketing. Get going with your new designs today. It's unreal. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. And while I'm on a roll of pointing you in the direction of people who who can help grow your business, if you've got some online marketing questions, blockages, needs, head over to netregistry.com.au. You can get your domain name registered, search engine optimization packages. You can get website hosting, website design and development. They'll set up Facebook ad campaigns for you. 
anything online that's kind of getting in your way from moving forward to helping you get found on Google, to helping you improve your online footprint, Net Registry are there to help you. Just do it, like assuming you've got the dough, but they're not expensive. And it's just one of those boxes that you need to tick. Remember guys, you are who Google says you are. So you want to have your online footprint sorted. Head over to netregistry.com.au and tell them Timbo sent you. So I got some beautiful feedback from David Meyer. Now, full disclosure, David's also my writer, my copywriter. He writes up the show notes for this show. So uh, David's a wonderful fellow, and he was quite touched by episode 208, in which I interviewed Troy and Zara from Humor Australia about how to use humor to grow your business. And I just want to share this feedback, because within this feedback, there is also an idea for you to further that concept of using humor in your business. David says, when Zara was, t- uh, was talking about putting some space between you and your reaction and using humor as compassion, I was nodding along because these are all really strong principles of mindfulness and Buddhist practice. For example, one kind of meditation I like to do that builds compassion and connection is when I see someone in some kind of pain, Now, have a think, guys, and work with this uh, in terms of you in front of a client. I try to breathe in their pain and breathe out something good for them. If this gets a bit woo-woo, it works, though, all right? Woo-woo is good. If there is somebody in the supermarket struggling to be patient with a long queue, I would breathe in and feel their frustration and breathe out calmness for them. This is basically a practice that helps us to train our brains in being compassionate in our everyday lives. It's a good thing in general. Totally agree with that, David. But could be particularly useful for business owners who need to work on forming connections with clients or who struggle when working with difficult people. Oh, yeah. And it shows that a meditation is not always sitting cross-legged on the floor. Absolutely it's not. Meditation is just that beautiful singular focus on one thing, really. Recently, there's been a lot of scientific interest in mindfulness practice, and it's been shown to build grey matter in parts of the brain that help us with emotional connection, compassion, creativity, productivity, and that it decreases in the areas connected with stress and anxiety. David, that is a wonderful piece of feedback about that episode, but also a great tip for anyone listening. Um, Stopping. Uh, and putting a moment between you and whatever you're working on is a great thing. And I love the idea of, you know, you, you're about to ring a client or walk into a client meeting, just visually, visualizing that client, giving them some good energy, giving them some good thoughts will actually change the way you interact with that client, will we'll, we'll put some positive energy into that relationship that you're about to have with that person. So um, thank you so much, David, for that input. And listeners, Any input you have, head over to the show notes for the episode you've listened to at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com and leave a comment. I read them all and I respond to them all over at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Okay, well, that was a magical bit of feedback and here is a magical interview. (laughs) How's that for a segue? Now, this is, um, I want to introduce my guest. His name is Ray Secluna. Ray is an interesting fellow. I met him at a conference last week uh, on the Gold Coast uh, that we both spoke at. And I'd also previously been told about Ray as someone I should connect with and go and hear speak. And I did. I sat through his session and it was fantastic. How's this? Ray left school at 13, grew up in the tough western suburbs of Melbourne, He couldn't read or write till the age of 31, but at the age of 27, he had a business turning over $90 million, but by the age of 29, bankrupt. But then he made a fortune by bringing the Video Easy franchise to Australia and New Zealand. How's that? Very old school, the old video stores. But boy, did he do a good job with those Video Easy stores and his magic, well, his secret sauce, I should say, 
were magic moments, creating magic moments that surprised and delighted clients. So this is a bit of a, 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 a continuing discussion almost from a previous episode with Joshua Nichols from Platinum Electricians, where he talked about those one percenters. Uh, that really got some traction, that discussion, and this will continue uh, that kind of discussion. Magic moments are wonderful. There's not enough of them, as I said at the start of this episode. So let's get stuck into it. Here is Ray Sakluna. Ray Sakluna, welcome to the Small Business Big Marketing Show. Thank you very much, Tim, for having me. Now, Raymond, you were unable to read or write until you were 31. Why start then? Oh, mate, I just um, wasn't cut out for school. I found it very difficult, and uh, I was on a roll at 23. You were? Uh, yeah, probably made too much money too quickly. I was too young and too cocky, so I never... Uh, um, Looked at um, studying because it was difficult. I could I could add though. Oh, you could add numbers up. Let's talk yeah. about that. At, at twenty three, you started your third business that was turning over a lazy ninety million. That's nine zero dollars in just three years. By twenty nine, you were bankrupt. Firstly, how did you create such a business? Well, the, it was actually my third business. Yeah. Uh, yeah, um, my first business was when I was 13 as a sign writer, mm-hmm. and then my second business was a panel beater. I opened a panel beating shop at right. 17. So from 17, um, at 21, I got into video because I was a movie buff, and we went over the United States and we found a an old Philips or the first Philips recorder that came out with the one inch band recording format, and we decided to open up a video library. From there, I, at, um, I decided to look at um, wholesaling videos because we couldn't get enough videos to open up new or bigger or better stores. So I worked um, through a, a system and I came up with what was called the copy depth plan to satisfy consumers' demand on, um, on uh, videos. So I started leasing videos to retailers and that grew very, very quickly and my accountant became a partner. And um, from there, we started to um, lease probably 14,000, 15,000 new releases a day for a dollar. So, th- so this is a, um, a wholesale business that you gave videos to uh, retail outlets, correct? That's right. Yeah, right. we leased them to them. So they, they rented the videos of us for a dollar where they used to buy them for $138 for a video cassette. Okay. Yeah, right. So we le- leased it to them for a dollar. So rather than them trying to buy one or two to satisfy copy depth, they were able to lease 10, 15, 20 at a time for a short period of time and give them back to us. We then would put that into the wholesale division and we set up four wholesales around Australia to start to help stores open with better product. So, so mate, the, the cash register was uh, rather busy. Filling up on a daily basis, what happened? Mate, I um, sold to a, an American firm called RIA in the, um, in the 80s, I think in 83, 80, oh, actually, actually 84, just in that area. And I went to Singapore, they brought my wholesale division and they wanted to franchise in Australia. They brought also Focus Video and they wanted to um, use the leasing concept for their franchise mm-hmm. only. Um, yeah, we uh, we did a deal. It was the best deal that I'd done in my life. Uh, it was unconditional, um, so I wasn't allowed to wholesale. I wasn't allowed to retail. I wasn't allowed to uh, 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 franchise. So we did that deal, and within three months of doing the deal and putting pen to paper and getting a deposit, stock market crashed. The uh, yeah. Bank of uh, uh, the Westpac, I think, actually Westpac or Bank of uh, Perth they called in their funds from RIA. They put me then in receivership as a uh, unsecured creditor, and yeah, so life went from you know the very high to the very low very quickly. And I had to fight that battle for eighteen months in courts, and uh, managed to get it back. But by that time, I've only uh, I've already exhausted a lot of funds and uh, couldn't get the wholesale division back to where it was. So yeah, just came and went fairly quickly. So you you went bankrupt. Well, what happens is, I, I, you know, once I did that, um, 
uh, that deal and got the uh, the business back, I had to then sit with creditors and I um, negotiated a successful uh, payment plan to get back on to um, the um, distribution or the leasing program. Mm -hmm. And I was doing that for probably um, eight months, all the creditors agreed, but then Roadshow, um, Village Roadshow decided to, um, wanting to wipe off their $600,000 through their insurance and claim it as a, um, as a debt and wipe it off on their taxes. So to do that, they had to put me in a bankruptcy. Right. And, um, and so that's the story there. There was a moment uh, where you had to ring your old man and tell him what happened. Well, yeah. I, uh, at the end of the day, the, the house was put up for sale. Um, Whose house, house? The family house? Yeah, the family home, I called it. But he uh, corrected me and uh, said, uh, son, you lost our house, not our home. We still have a house. We just don't have a home to put it in. You know? So that gave me a little bit more of uh, inspiration to you know, start life again, but also look at it in a different way. And I decided then to um, maybe uh, educate myself to be a little smarter or brighter in those areas. You're obviously a positive fellow. Uh, it would have been a tough time. Is there a kind of secret to maintaining? Because you could have gone one of two ways. You could have thrown the towel in or you could have fought back. You got a bit of Rocky about you. You got a bit of, you're sort of a, you're a movie buff. You're a cross between Sylvester Stallone and Al Pacino, I reckon, having seen yeah. you last week. Well, yeah, the, uh, look, I think um, I'm probably a bit grateful that I was brought up in the western suburbs of Melbourne and I was surrounded by um, um, friends and... Uh, Fighters. Yeah, well, in those <laughs> days, we, you know, um, the motto was that uh, my, uh, my life depended on the people around me and I certainly knew growing into the business world that my business depended on the people around me again. So, Do you still live by that motto? Start with either him. So if I had nothing, as my father pointed out to me, he said, son, you know, you've been all over the world, you've made a lot of money, you employed a lot of people, you've had a great journey, you know, at the end of the day, you're far better and far more knowledgeable than when you started. So take it in your stride and these things bring out the best in people. So let's go. Because I said to him... That's great oh, advice. Dad. Yeah, I said, dad, you know, I've gave it my best shot. He said, you haven't even begun. You're 29 years old. Oh. You know? He said, tell me you gave it your best shot when someone's reading your eulogy. You know? And uh, so, yeah, he just, um, you know, we rented a house and uh, I have four, uh, four brothers and one sister and many uh, cousins and relationships, you know. Um, so we, we, uh, we moved on. And, Jeez, uh, mate, what a great old man. I mean, that's just, that's just solid advice. Yeah, what, what was that Monty Python line? You come with nothing, you're going back with nothing. So what are you lost? <laughs> nothing. That's it, mate. <laughs> I was uh, pretty good in that area. Yeah. Goodness me. I was that's... fortunate enough to, um, whilst I was selling to RIA, I was fortunate enough to learn a little bit about the blockbuster franchise in the United States because I travelled there to uh, be able to do that deal. And I was going to actually go and live in the United States and work with RAA for a while, setting up a wholesale division there. But, you know, when I got back, um, yeah, the, um, we decided to franchise, put 100 retailers in the room, and we told them about a concept, um, and uh, they uh, walked away with uh, 70 of them put $20,000 on the table for uh, a, a, a territory. So, um, and that's how, is that how Video Easy was, was born? Well, it was actually Fountain Flicks. Fountain Flicks. Uh, Video Easy came uh, you know, uh, probably a year later. So I had 77, 70 Fountain Flick stores, franchise. Hmm. And then uh, Video Easy, a friend of mine, had the name and 13 stores, and he wanted to join our brand. And I took that name and then converted all our stores to Video Easy because it made more sense. All right. So well, let's talk about that because um, Video Easy was a, was a wonderful success story, and I know you used marketing very cleverly. And you know, this is pre-internet, so it's always fun to have an old school marketing discussion, Ray. Yeah. Um, marketing at Video Easy became a, you know, for overseas listeners, it's kind of like just a, an amazingly um, a very strong Australian brand name. You know, uh, almost kind of symbolic. It represents the whole of the video retail market in Australia. So, what was your what what was your view on marketing back there, and what aspects of marketing did you most use? Well, uh, back in the, those days, and you know, we're talking that I sold it off um, sixteen years ago, and uh, after my father passed away, I went sailing, and I thought, you know, life's too short, so I enjoyed that. But prior to that, for the ten years that we were building that brand. 
our, we believe our success was around our people, our young um, team members and our franchisees. And we wanted to make sure they understood that they were the most important link to the uh, business. And they're at the coal, uh, the coal face, so they had to be able to, what we call, create these magic moments. And the magic moments is nothing more than um, understanding what the customer really wanted and going out of your way to not only satisfy their uh, needs but to exceed so most of the people come in and they want to be satisfied or they expect to be satisfied and they're entitled to be satisfied that's what they're there for mm -hmm. but to exceed expectation was to do that little extra do that and so we understood at that very young uh, uh, very young time in business that whilst we thought we had a marketing division we actually had a advertising division that was doing all the ad uh, ads in place push push and push yeah, so we had to um, uh, align ourselves with our training. So our marketing division um, was all encompassing process and we made sure that marketing included our training. So every time we did a campaign for a million dollars, we would do a $100,000 training um, exercise around the country to make sure that our team members had a buy-in. They knew exactly what we were uh, doing and they also knew that they had to deliver the promises we were making. So we needed to get them involved in that area. So that's where we focus, but we had to also focus on one message. And we looked at the number of messages and deals that were out in the marketplace and we decided to uh, promote the famous uh, get it first time, get it free. That was the video easy guarantee. Okay. Mm -hmm. So we went down that path and educated our team members and trained our team members and put a lot of time in our training. And we um, and then started to make those promises knowing that we could deliver them back at the coalface. So we started to create these little magic moments, little things like when a customer came in and wanted an old movie that we didn't have, you know, team members were instructed to um, ask the member if they wouldn't mind a moment, they'd ring Blockbuster up the road and see if they have that movie for them. And if they did, we'll get them to revisit, reserve it for them. So we oh. would ring our opposition to see if a movie's in for a customer uh, that wanted to watch a particular movie. And it was if it wasn't there, they were instructed to write that movie down and we would go out of our way to get that movie in without telling the customer. Love and then, it. Then deliver that uh, movie to the customer, giving them a call and say, hey, notice that you wanted uh, to watch this old classic or this old movie. We now got it in and we put it aside for you. So they are the little things that we were focused on. Okay. Get uh, get it first time, get it free. We uh, haven't had the guarantee discussion on this show before, though I've had it inside the Small Business Big Marketing Forum where people are questioning whether they should offer a guarantee. Was it something you needed? Did it cost you a lot of dough, that guarantee, or was it? did it build you a lot of business? It built us a lot of business. When yeah. we first started it, we had an idea, and you know, with all good marketing initiatives, you need to probably weigh up you know, whether it's a loss leader or a traffic driver. And we decided it was going to be a loss leader. So we would pick one of the best movies of the uh, of the month and we would buy a lot of those. And we were doing a, a deal with the distributor who had that so we can get it cheaper because we committed to buying 50 copies yeah, of, right. the, of the store of that movie. So we would then guarantee that particular movie for that month, you know, mm -hmm. and though the perception, because perception becomes reality in marketing, look at Coca-Cola, the real feeling. They never sold a, a fizzy drink in their life. You know? So what happens for us was that we, it worked so well and we weren't giving away a lot of free movies because we had the copy dip that we expanded it to two, three and up to seven titles a month and we were chosen as the first um, point or the first choice when you wanted a movie. Now, go down a movie a video easy. If you don't get it the first time, they guarantee you'll get it free. So you walk in and you look on the shelves. And look, some people maybe um, um, abuse the system by looking on the shelf to see if there was any of the movies, if they were all out, and they were all out, they would come to the counter and say, I want that one. They knew it was out. So that didn't worry us because the numbers, the law of averages set into yeah. play. So. We had to, you know, train our people and train our franchisees to understand that. So, yes, to answer your question, a guarantee makes a big difference in business. You know, it's the same as when we speak or I speak now and people say, oh, hi, so I'll give you a guarantee. If you don't like 
what I speak about or your audience is not happy, I won't charge you. Now, that's a big call. It is. Have I ever had to not charge anybody to date? Not once. You know? So guarantees make it. Do you ask afterwards? Yes, I do. So, you know, at the end of the day, I say, well, how did I go? Mm -hmm. Was everybody happy? And you know very well, you know, being there that um, the audience is happy because of the amount of comments you get after the uh, the event and how many people are coming up to you and shaking your hand or ask, asking for your card or signing your book and so forth and you know and then they give you the survey so yeah look if most people in business have integrity so when you look somebody in the eye and say so how do they go and you could see that person in the audience having a good a giggle you put a lump in their throat a tear in their eye and you know that um, you know the story you're telling is genuine so they walk up to you and say, look, mate, fantastic. You're worth what, uh, what you charge, and thank you very much. So, no, a lot of people have that integrity. I Ray, did you have a process in at Video Easy to come up with magic moments? We, did, we, we had a training program, okay? It was a full training program. We would go out in what we call clusters, and we would train our young people, and we would have – the same training session on over two nights so every single team member would attend and uh, we would do the magic moment um, uh, presentation. So we would start off by explaining that everything we do at the store is marketing, the way we look, the way we talk, the way we um, dress. We talked about our you know, uniform, it's not just about wearing it, it's about wearing it well, you know. And uh, we talked about the atmosphere in the store, the music, the carpet, the shelvings, you know, everything we did was connected to our marketing message. So when people walked in, they don't, didn't need to see so much that the store was in order, they needed to feel it was in order. They needed to see the hump um, with, you know, the bounce in the, in the young uh, people's steps. And so we educated them, but more, more so not motivated them. We inspired them to do better. And we talked about their lives and what they wanted to be when they grew up because we created magic moments with our team. And that, that meant that we wanted to listen to their baggage because their foundation wasn't good at home. It would Uh, affect their productivity back at work so most people always in business have the philosophy that says well you're not start off start at eight o'clock leave your baggage at the door now Mm. we wanted them to bring the baggage in because we were naive to think if uh, we didn't they wouldn't be talking about it lunchtime so we wanted to help as many of the young kids understand that we had a career at video easy as well or they could have ended up being a franchisee because 50 of our managers were supported throughout this process of 10 years to open up their own video easy store now they never dreamed at any hmm. point that they would get their own business but they showed the initiative so everybody started to understand that it was a people focused culture mm-hmm. But a customer-focused culture. Now, a couple of things there. One is beautiful consistency of touch points. I love the way you, you know, every single one of those components of walking into a video easy store added up to a whole. So individually, you know, a staff member looking uh, w- looking good in their uniform, that's good. But if all the shelves are, you know, looking good, if the carpet's clean, if the right, if there are, if there are movies playing on the TV screen, the signage is right. That adds up, you know, all of a sudden one and one equals 11. Absolutely, uh, Tim. And, you know, when you're uh, advertising on TV, as we were in those days and on radio, a lot of people had an image. So we would pick the best people to advertise, of course. But what we started doing is using our real people on our TV ads, our real team members, because no no good portraying this and going into a store that, that didn't shine. Now, I can't vouch for them today, but I know 16 years ago anybody walked into a Video Easy store because I have photos of all of them and they looked every inch um, a champion because they, they believed in that whole process. So they started creating magic moments. Kids have started to look at uh-huh. how to, to create those moments. Okay, you know? so that's what I'm interested in. So all of a sudden, so <clears throat> you you and your, your management team, I'm guessing, came up with some magic moments like the guarantee and lo- you know th- at, like ringing Blockbuster down the road to see if they had the video if you didn't. Uh, you went out and trained your the, the young people on your team with those magic moments. But there was a point then when all of a sudden you're starting to get phone calls or emails saying, hey, what about this, Mr. Cicluna? Mm. Well, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Look, look um, we had our young kids um, um, 
take ownership in some of those areas. So some of the things that, that would come through that made a big difference to our income, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So what we were looking for was, you know, what was our fries with that? Okay, um, you look at McDonald's and they had 20,000 young people simultaneously every second ask you whether you want fries with that. Mm -hmm. So what was our fries, you know? How could we be unique but individual at the same time? And so young people started to work towards, you know, our our um, birthday cards. We used to give our birthday cards to um, people and everybody was doing that, you know? And so they would turn around and say, well, look, Ray, we've got a great idea. So what's that? And they said, we want to give our birthday cards. I said, well, that's what we do now. And they said, yeah, but we don't want you to give us a video easy birthday card. We want to go and buy birthday cards. I said, well, great, that's a great idea. And what do you want to do with them? And they wanted to send out the birthday cards, which w worked a treat, an absolute treat, mm. because they sent out birthday cards to only males. And the males were the ones that appreciated it more than anybody. Right. And people would say, well, I find that hard to believe. Well, let me tell you what the young kids put in place. They sent out birthday cards to the males, a blank one, with a voucher for a dinner with two with one of our partners in our clusters because we did partner up with people that did massage, oh, yeah. you know, car washes, all that sort of stuff, you know, flowers, chocolates and dinners and so mm -hmm. forth. And we would give the partners, you know, uh, deals at our store so they can market as well. But they sent the mail birthday card to males with a letter and the, the birthday card was a lovely birthday card with nothing in it and said dear Tim we just want to remind you it's your wife's birthday next week with enclosed a, uh, a blank birthday card with a dinner for two for, for both of you hope you enjoy at the end of the day so they reminded the mail <laughs> that his wife's birthday was next week and we went and brought a lovely card on his behalf to give out and we had males coming in th saying to us, oh, great, mate, can you put our anniversary date in there? <laughs> you know, so that, did, we, were you really giving a, You weren't giving away dinner for twos, were you? I mean, that's, we, we were because we didn't have to give out a lot of the, those and we were able to do... Why, why not? Half your customers are males and a dinner for two, you know, we're, talk, we're talking a few bucks on a purchase of a, of a lease of a video, which is only a few, few coin, a few coins. Well, let's let's go through that. The yeah. lifetime value of our customer was wasn't two dollars. Gotcha. They were renting three, four times a week. Lifetime value. A day, a, a year, and they were our, our customer for five years. So our lifetime value of a customer was like twelve thousand mm -hmm. dollars. So understanding that, when we go and look at. Um, and people, especially our top, what we call Express, Easy Express members, which are the high level of uh, expenditure, mm -hmm. we would do a deal with um, restaurants where we would give them heaps of free movie vouchers for their free dinner vouchers. So they might give us five dinner vouchers and we would give them $500 worth of free video vouchers mm -hmm. for their customers. So we contrast yeah, yeah, yeah. a lot of our products with these 10 partners that we decided to get in each territory. So partnering up really worked for us because they were able to promote our business to their clients. We were able to promote their business to our clients, you know. And it was easy for us because we had a lot of clientele coming in regularly which is every week 2,500, 3,000 people coming through the door. So people wanted to get to that database. So it was easy to be able to um, come up with some of these deals. So, you know, that was one of the young kids for Magic Moments. We had a problem always collecting overdues, you know, and uh, it was more like a fine. You know, you come in and you look someone in the eye and say, well, you know, you got, um, you know, hundred dollars worth of overdues, Tim, you know. So one of the young kids renamed that for us and they called it extended rental fees. And that's what we went on the war path in our next training sessions and um, um, creating this where we could look, look you in the eye with a smile and say, Tim, you must have really enjoyed that movie, mate. You've got seven hundred and fifty dollars <laughs> extended rental fees, you know? So I mean you could have bought this for a lot cheaper. So again we had we had a little bit of fun with that magic moment, but we also realize that people left it in the car forgot about it you know and if they're really high so we you know um put in the plan that the extended rental fees if we got only um 10 percent of those we would make a lot of money so we went into overdrive with our extended rental uh, fee program Love it. That came that came from juniors and uh, that lifted our income dramatically. And um, so we were looking for all these sort of things, you know, um, to be able to do. But mostly it was how the teams acted 
at the time of point of purchase, you know, and, you know, how they were respectful and how they understood very quickly the personality of the person they're talking to because we have different people. Some people want to get in and out very quickly. You can you can see that. And some people want to chat. Mm. So, mm. again, respect was a big thing, you know, how to deal with the baby boomers, you know, and um, and the older generation in those, those times. And so, again, that made a big difference, especially for the older generation, how the younger generation actually treated them to create that magic moment. That's nothing more than, you know, if there's a lineup, you know, eye contact, recognition, a smile, a finger uh, up saying, be with you in a minute, sorry, we're a little bit, with sincerity. So magic moments are also between team member and team member, praising each other for the good work they did and looking for the best in one another rather than the, the, the worst. Real easy to find the negative. You know, in- Ray, it, it's almost, it saddens me to say this, but as you're talking and explaining the environment, uh, I, well, I, it doesn't sound, sadden me to think that what a wonderful place it would have been to be a young person uh, with your first job at Video Easy. Fantastic grounding. But what it does sadden me is that we don't get this enough. These days, uh, I'm just trying to reflect on times. And, you know, I've stayed at a lot of five-star hotels like <coughs> you do when we speak. Um, well, I yeah. buy a lot of things. I like to go shopping. Um I'm just trying to think of moments where a magic moment that I've had in the last six months, and I, I'm struggling. I, I, I'll tell you one. I'll tell you one. Last week, we were both on the Gold Coast, and I dropped some dry cleaning off at the dry cleaners around from the hotel where we were staying, realized that I wasn't able to pick it up uh, before I needed it, so I went down to the concierge and said, would you mind picking it up? He said, yes. That's. It's not really actually a magic moment. I would have kind of... I would have been disappointed if he had said no. Um, why don't we see this? Mate, I think what happens is we lose sight in this world that we live in, that we talk half as much as we used to. So I talk to my children half as much as my father talked to me, mm. and he talked to his children half as much as his father talked to him, and so on. So we lost the art of conversation and connecting, building relationships. It's a fast world we live in, and sometimes we blame the younger generation, but we forget who brought, who brought them up and who is bringing them up. So I read an article that read, that the younger generation do not know the meaning of respect or work ethics today. And that article was written in 1839. <laughs> we all have the same... What are you doing uh, reading uh, newspapers from 1839 out of interest? Sorry? What are you doing reading newspapers from 1839? <clears throat> well, the, the, uh, when we had that um, the discussion, I was doing some research right. on some technology and I wanted to uh, show the technology between, and I come across that and I thought, wow, what a great thing to uh, have read out now. You know? So and- so you reckon, so your theory that because we're not, we're not speaking enough, not, an, not enough face-to-face contact, there's less opportunities for magic moments? Absolutely. And there's not, not, not enough one-on-ones between a coach and team member, in other words, staff and employer, you know, one-on-ones and staff. I have staff meetings. I used to have them every Monday morning you know, and uh, talk about, and we used to sit in the middle of the shop together. We all grab a chair each and sit in the middle of the store while customers coming in and have our meeting in the middle whilst customers are walking around looking for things because we were creating a magic moment there because it's a process of osmosis. We were sitting there and absorbing everything around us in the right atmosphere, having a giggle and laugh and looking at ways to be able to go that extra mile. Now, when you talk about concierge, you can walk into a concierge, into a hotel and you'll read a mission statement or a statement on the back. Oh, wall. yeah, whatever. And then you ask the, con- the, the, the person or the person behind the counter, oh, Mission statement, that's great. And the person looks at you and says, oh, yeah, that's um, yeah, what, uh, what we really um, we stand for. And, um, you know, that's yeah. the boss puts up there. Now, I don't feel real good about that because mm. he hasn't put his hand on his t- heart. He doesn't believe in the, mi- the statement. But if I walked in and someone said, well, sir, let me tell you what we stand for, exactly that. You know, mm. this is going to be the best day of your life. Not only are we going to take your baggage upstairs on the trolley, we're going to put you on the trolley as well and give you a ride up, you know. So <laughs> what I want to do is put a smile on your dollar, just a small one. Yep. You know, you'll deal with like, men and women are different, you know, and you know, we need to respect that. So, you know, look at Apple. A perfect example, they had a point of difference. The point of difference was their product. Mm. And everybody believes you can get a product 
that no one else can get and that they can only buy it from you, then what happens? That company actually becomes a little arrogant in their sales mm -hmm. because Apple, you couldn't buy it from anywhere else but Apple in the old days. But when they realized that the magic moments were all based of, in their young people in red and blue, the geeks of the world, mm -hmm. when you walk into their environment, now they have more money surplus, they can bail out Greece from bankruptcy. So it wasn't about the Apple computer. It was a combination of feel, look, taste, uh, and the people. The people were delivering that um, those magic moments. Well, were Apple, Apple's magic moment, uh, and careful, mate, you like calling my ch children ugly by saying Apple's arrogant. I do love Apple, right? I um, said, no, I said, <laughs> I said that uh, uh, people that have their own product start to become arrogant and sell it a different way. I didn't say Apple. Yeah, right. Okay. Yep. But, but so Apple's magic moment in itself is probably the one of the biggest ones I can think of, and we almost kind of take it for granted but it's the only computer brand that actually has retail stores that you can go into and seek help from absolutely it's a, that's it's a massive a, magic moment so you don't need to recognize or be told about it you actually feel correct you're, you're right you're in the right environment you can feel it people feel um, things when they're in order they don't have to actually see it they don't have to be told about it you actually know and see you know my wife comes out a lot of retail stores and she has her arms crossed and her head's shaking her head shaking mm. and i say what she says don't even go down there you know she's dissatisfied <laughs> and the most unfulfilled emotion today is this uh, is satisfaction but I went into the store to get satisfied. That's what I expect. Mm. And if I'm not even satisfied, I haven't even got the base one. Now, if I go in a store and expect to get satisfied, but the young people behind the counter actually exceed my expectations by a little, then I think to myself, oh, geez, you know, I feel a bit different. And I tell that story time and time again to people. So, yeah, Apple is a big tick for me. Love Apple too, Tim. You know? I'm going to set our listeners a challenge, Ray, and I know you'll support this, but it is about... Yeah, they're all business owners. Um, go and set up or come up with at least one magic moment in the next week. And the question that you need to ask is quite simply, how can I exceed my customers' expectations? And, and, and go and do it. And if you do it, send it in to Tim at smallbusinessbigmarketing.com on the email and and I'll share it in an upcoming show, and I'll let I'll let Ray know too. Ray, um, you, your wife has a um, a lovely story about a local petrol station that offers some some magic moments. Absolutely, yeah. You want the, you want me to tell you that story? <laughs> I do, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's even it's hard though without the body language, isn't it? Ah, oh, it is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that's all right. But I'll tell you uh, I'll tell you here because I think that's probably one of the m most memorable uh, massive moment, moments that she talks about frequently, but. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, most ladies uh, hate the thought of pumping petrol in their cars or lifting up the hood and looking for that little bo bottle that holds the soapy water to clean the bugs off their windscreen or even trying to check um, their, their air in their tyre. Now, that's on a good day, but on a bad day when it's pissing down rain, which, it, it, which happens often on the Gold Coast, it becomes even more of a challenge. So my wife go, had gone to a, a local garage for a... A, a number of years and uh, there's a young lad who works at that garage he was probably 21 at the time and um, she would wind down her window just a touch and she would yell out his name hey uh, uh, and uh, uh, he would come to the windscreen uh, to the uh, window and he'd say yes mrs sequona you know and um, Darren was his name. So he'd come to the uh, window and he would she would turn around and say to him, do your stuff so he puts petrol in her car, puts soapy water in her um, uh, bot uh, bottle under the hood, and she, he cleans her windscreen, pumps up her tyres, and then takes her credit card and gets her two bottles of milk and a loaf of bread because that was her request, and he comes back, and it's all done and dusted, and she's still in the comfort of her car. Now, how many people or ladies do you think my wife has told about that service mm -hmm. station? The ladies are lined up waiting 15 minutes to be served by young Daniel. And uh, now that he's taken his top off and they've got him with no, no shirt on, his line is a, a lot larger. But he serves ladies to a point that loyalty sets in. So he treated, he treats or they treat the ladies like ladies. They treat blokes like blokes. I'm driving home from Brisbane with my wife, who is really loyal to that service station, and so is her friends. They just keep talking about it, talking about it, talking about it. 
and I'm driving home and I've got 15 k's left in my tank, my light's flashing, you know, and uh, I'm in Brisbane, Daniel's on the Gold Coast, 80 k's away, and I said to my wife, I've got to get some petrol, it was her car I was driving, by the way, and uh, she said, well, you need to go to Daniel's, I said, darling, I've got 15 k's in the tank, you know, and Daniel's 80 k's away, she looked me straight in the eye and says, you need to try, you know, <laughs> and uh, I thought to myself, well, this is loyalty at its best, and I said, but... You know, what about the price of petrol I brought up? And I said, what about the price of petrol? You know, I'm surely we need to compare, you know, the service is one thing, but price is also a big factor. She said, it's the same as everywhere else. I said, it can't be. She said, it is. I told Daniel to put $70 in the tank, and that's what Daniel puts in the tank, you know. Mm -hmm. So, again, it's about their loyalty. They don't care mm -hmm. about logics. They care about uh, the loyalty. So I turn up to the service station the first time. I can see who Daniel is, handsome young lad serving everybody, and I wind down my window and I whistle out to him, hey, Daniel, and he comes bolsing over, and I said, mate, fill her up, and he looks at me and he turns around and says, what are you, a wuss? I said, oh. and he said, mate, look, read the sign, and the sign says, we look after the women in your life, the rest is up to you, and he turned around to me and said, if you want me to put fuel in your tank, mate, you go home and put a bloody skirt on, but he created a magic moment with me as well. He treated me like a bloke. He treated my wife like a lady. Yeah. So at the end of the day, loyalty sets in and loyalty drives sales. And that loyalty set in because he created magic moments for the right people at the time. So, mate, it's sad he's no longer there. He probably should have ended up owning that garage. He certainly should have. Mate, that's a great story. An excellent one to finish on. And um, yeah. and thank you so much, A, for sharing uh, quite a personal part of your business journey up front, Ray, and then um, getting stuck into what I think is a really important topic for businesses going forward, and that is creating magic moments, which, by the way, don't have to cost anything. Another interesting marketing strategy that no. uh, just requires a bit of thought. So, listeners, I hope you do uh, I hope you do go and come up with your own magic moment or two. Hey, Ray, thanks for being part of the small business big marketing community. Thank you, Tim. Pleasure. Oh, I love that song by the Cars, 1980s. Love it. Takes me right back. Big hair, shoulder pads, all that stuff. Love it. Oh, I digress. Hey, what about that interview with Ray and the challenge to be set? Hey, I want to hear about your magic moments that you develop as a result of it. Now, I want to share my top three learnings. Thanks to 99designs.com forward slash SBBM and to the very good folk at Net Registry. My number one learning from it, well, actually, they're not in particular order, but they could be this time. Number one, create magic moments, guys. Like, we've just got to do that. We've got to exceed our clients' and our customers' expectations, and as a result, get talked about. That will create word of mouth, and it will create word of mouse. So go ahead and start creating magic moments. Make that like number one point in your marketing strategy, you know, alongside all the other things you got to do, but that would be a good one. Number two, what's your would you like fries with that offer? I think it's a great question to ask ourselves, you know, like uh, again, being able to upsell people to something more is a good thing. McDonald's have done it for years. It works. And again, it's something we could all inject into our businesses. And number three, I love the way Ray t talked about touch point consistency. You know, when you walked in to a Video Easy store, there was this beautiful consistency. You know, there was the people, the staff looked great in the uniforms, the shelves were all stocked, there was great signage, the place was clean, there were movies playing on the TV screen. And it was the same no matter what Video Easy store you walked into. So that's important. And if, by the way, if you want to get kind of your branding consistency done or design consistency sorted out, that's a great way to use 99designs. They have a um, brand identity pack where you can get all your stationery and all the bit, different bits and bobs of your marketing touch points done by the one designer. So there's this beautiful consistency. So... There you go. There are my three learnings from my chat with Ray. Love to know what yours are. Head over to smallbusinessbigmarketing.com. Look for episode 210 and leave a comment in the show notes. Would love to hear from you. But right now, go and start creating some magic moments. Small Business Big Marketing with Tim Reid. Right, I we're nearly at the end, but I want to share an inspirational quote of the week with you. It's from Abraham Lincoln. He says... 
If I had nine hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend the first six sharpening my axe. That basically says spend two thirds of your time planning and one third executing. And I like that. You are doing your planning now by listening to this show, but please, please, please go and execute, go and implement, go and take action. You know, last week's episode where Griffo and I talked all about taking action, there is magic in the action. So please listen to what Abraham says, sharpen that axe for more time than you take action, but be sure to take action. Righto team, next week I've got the founder of Tracker, a very cool little tracking device uh, that's come on the market and I'm seeing it all over my Facebook feed. I don't know whether you are, but I certainly am. Christian, the owner, crowdfunded $1.25 million on Indiegogo. And we're going to find out about how he did that and how he got track at a market. Remember to join the Small Business Big Marketing Forum. I'm in there every day answering your questions, and so are a whole lot of other motivated business owners. Great way to keep yourself accountable and move forward in your business. A big thank you to Net Registry and to 99designs.com forward slash SBBM for making this show possible. Until next week, may your marketing be the best marketing. It's been Timbo Reid here signing off from the Small Business Big Marketing HQ. You've been listening to the Small Business Big Marketing Show with Tim Reid. Want more marketing goodness? Then visit smallbusinessbigmarketing.com.